Good morning. We're now recording. Good morning, everyone. It is 10.03 a.m. on October 30th. And, sorry, I was, uh, got caught off guard there. And it is... Um, This meeting is now called to order. Esta reunión, se está, esta sesión inicia, se está iniciando. I'm sorry, One, can house... you hold just a moment? I yes. need to identify our interpreter. I apologize. Is that Silvana that's our interpreter today? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, great. Let me go ahead and turn on our interpretation tool. That way you can go into the Spanish channel and we will proceed. Apologies. Okay, I've turned on the language interpretation now. And you can proceed, Chair. Okay, thank you. So that leads me to my first thing, our housekeeping reminder. We have a Spanish interpreter for today's meeting. And even if you are able to hear me now, we ask that you select your preferred language, either English or Spanish, in the Zoom application at the bottom of your screen. This will ensure you are able to fully hear the audio of today's proceedings. And Santiago, can you relay that in Spanish? Buenos días y gracias por acompañarnos hoy en nuestra junta. Tenemos servicio de interpretación por medio de Zoom. Hacia el abajo de su pantalla puede ver un glóbulo que dice interpretación o idiomas. Por favor, haga clic y escoja su idioma, sea español o inglés. Aunque vaya a escuchar en inglés, por favor, elija el idioma que le va a permitir escuchar la junta sin pausas. Gracias. Thank you, Santiago. Appreciate that. Okay, next I will call the roll. Board member Broad. Present. Board member Flores. Present. Board member Hall is not here today. Board member Lightstone. Present. Okay. Board members, we have a quorum. Also present from our staff um, today is our executive secretary, as you heard, um, Santiago Villa Gomez, who is providing technical support. Um, okay, uh, our next, our first agenda item is to approve the meeting minutes from October 2nd. May I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Member Flores. Um, Board Member Lightstone, do you Aye. vote? Aye. I also vote to approve. The meetings from October 2nd are approved. Um, next, we have our chair's report. I have a couple items. Um, one, want to acknowledge since our last meeting last um, Friday, the state honored um, Larry Itliong Day, a Filipino um, labor leader who was very active in the West Coast labor movement and also very instrumental in working with United Farm Workers. Um, and, and, other, uh, and other groups to help um, establish uh, our act and our agency and was very active. So want to commemorate that. Um, next, uh, we have a, a, a two-step process. Um, we added uh, um, within the 10-day notice period an item to our agenda regarding um, a proposal to open up a new office in Santa Maria. So first the board will need to vote to affirm the addition. So it's a Bagley Keene related requirement. And then we'll discuss the actual proposal and the board will vote on that. So first, in order to get into this discussion, um, may I have a motion to hear the item? I move that we hear the item. Okay. Second. Office in Santa Maria. Thank you. Member Lights on second. Um, Member Flores, do you, how do you vote? Yay or nay? Uh, aye. Aye. I also vote, thank you. So um, we were able to hear the item. Now we'll now turn it to over to our general counsel, Julie Montgomery, to discuss the proposal. Good morning, members of the board and chair. Um, let's see where it is. So the proposal that, that we have before you today is to establish an office in Santa Maria. And just to give you a little background about how this came about and why we're making this proposal, um, we started seeing an increase in activity in the farm worker community with a lot of uh, protected activity um, happening in, in various commodities in that Northern Santa Barbara County, Santa Maria area uh, several years ago. 
and we, we saw an increase in charge filings. And then in early 2022, so almost two years ago, we made the decision, the GC program made the decision to house an attorney, Yesenia Polido, in Santa Maria. And um, she was originally going to go to the Salinas office, but when we, we realized, oh, she's already in Santa Maria and there was so much activity going on there, um, it, just, it just made sense to have her work out of Santa Maria and, and continue in that area. And so her presence has continued to um, increase the charge filings and settlements in that area and has provided a lot of support uh, for our cases over there. And she has reported to various nonprofit offices uh, to do office hours so that she's there on a regular basis, both at uh, Cause and My Cop, which are two nonprofits in the area that serve farm workers. And, and she's just been there as a resource to meet with workers if they have questions or, or needs and, and also to help uh, with the various case matters, some of which are assigned to her and others are, which are assigned to other, other ALRB staff. And she, she provides support for them just in, if they need signatures on documents or gather, gather information, evidence, et cetera. So, so it's been a huge help to have her in that area. And at the same time, now we're, we're in starting off on the rural strategic engagement program, which I know we, we've talked about previously, um, which is a project, uh, a limited term project, where we are hiring additional staff with, um, with, with some, some funds that the Department of Finance has uh, granted to us uh, for, for this purpose to help with collaboration uh, with, with our other state partners at the Labor Commissioner, uh, Cal OSHA, EDD, LWDA, and there have been regular wage clinics that the labor commissioner has been holding in Santa Maria, which has also increased um, participation by the community in, in state processes. And so we've been collaborating more with these groups. And, um, and, and as part of those efforts, I know the labor commissioner has also expressed an interest in trying to find a presence or, or establish more of a presence in that area. And as part of that program, we do have some positions uh, that we want to place in Santa Maria, which include a field examiner and a uh, senior legal typist, which is a, like a you know administrative support position for those who might not be familiar with that. And, and so then that would mean we would have three staff working in Santa Maria, which will now necessitate an office space. Um, and it'll also be really helpful for Yesenia Polido to have a regular office space to go to and work out of together with the other staff uh, at the ALRB that we will place there on this project. So in looking around at different office op space options, we realized that there's a real lack of opportunity and space in this area. Um, and we really, because this is a limited term project, we need to find somewhere we can get in quickly and sublease uh, rather than start in a whole process to do a long, what we can't do a long term lease because of the, the limited nature of the project, but also um, just the, the Department of General Services process takes a very long time. And this project really needs to be up and running ASAP because it is limited term. So that's why we need to get in somewhere quickly where we can um, establish an office, hire staff, and get going on this project. So that's part of the reasoning behind what, what's in this proposal. So we did find available office space that's um, very centrally located in Santa Maria on, um, on Broadway, which is a main boulevard going through Santa Maria, if any of you are familiar with that area. And, and it is an office Space that um, we are sublease, we're planning to sublease. So this is a proposal: is to sublease from Cause, where we've been um, ha having office hours regularly, and Yesenia Polido has been going there regularly uh, already. But but this would be subleasing a small amount of space, which would basically just be one office and a and a cubicle area, reception area. Uh, for, for our staff that they would share. And then we would have access to a conference room and then the general space, like the you know restrooms, coffee room, et cetera. 
break room. And, and we've um, been able to work it out with them to, um, to be able to start this lease uh, within, you know, this next month, if it, if it's approved and, and it'll be on a, we, it, it can be terminated on a 30 day notice basis if there's a problem or it's not working out for one reason or another. But, but this is a way for us to get in quickly and be somewhere centrally located um, where we've already been showing up and having a presence. So it really makes sense. And we will also be putting a lot of safeguards in place to make sure that there's a clear, as we have been thus far, but even more so now you know, that we're leasing the space, we're gonna have these safeguards to make sure that, that we're very clearly separated from cause so that that it's clear with signage and entrances and everything um, that, okay, this is ALRB over here and we're not affiliated with cause, we're separate from them um, so that so that there's no confusion there. And and I believe, you know, cause has as, at least as much interest in that as we do and is to, to maintain that separation. And also if there do end up being cases as, it, as has happened in the past where cause might be either a party or a witness, um, we will firewall those, or at least not, we will not assign those to the local Santa Maria staff. We will have those assigned to people at a different office just to make absolutely sure that there is that separation and there, there isn't any um, appearance of, of any impropriety there. So, that that is what the proposal is. It's to to get in and and sublease a space uh, with with cause, and and we are able to do it. Um, you know, within within our authority, um, with with DGS or finance or I, whoever it is that gives us authority to enter into contracts. So, uh, if there's any questions, I can answer them. Um, otherwise. I, I guess that's that's pretty much, hopefully I remembered everything. I think that's it. That sounds great. Do any of my colleagues have any questions? Okay, um, and just a note, really appreciate the general counsel and our um, administrative staff, Dalton Weber, as well as our regional director, Jessica um, Arseniega and, and our staff member there. Um, I, I think this is a really great opportunity. It's a way where we can serve the public um, much better. And it really follows this philosophy that we've been trying to implement across the board, literally and figuratively, um, to meet workers where they're at. And I think it's a great example of um, our ability to be nimble and kind of really navigate, um, navigate some of the bureaucracy pretty well. So huge kudos to the GC team, the regional directors team, the regional office team, and then also uh, Dalton as well for the work that he did. Um, I, I uh, strongly agree with us opening an office there and um, not uh, seeing any other questions or comments. Uh, I would just have one comment. Okay. I think it's, I think that the general counsel's outline of this caution she's taken are well taken. So. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I think we've kind of talked through a lot of making sure we have appropriate safeguards in place, but it's um, lack of, there's quite a lack of space in Santa Maria generally and certainly state office building. So it was great that we were able to find um, this space that worked within our budget. So, um, and that was available. And with that, um, I will make a motion that we approve of the, um, uh, or authorize the general counsel to open this new office in Santa Maria. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, board member Broad. Um, board member Flores, how do you vote? Aye. Board member Lightstone, how do you vote? It's an aye as well. Um, and so yes, there's approval to open the office. Thank you very much. Um, and then my last item in the chair's report is just a note that this year's farm worker breakfast um, will be held on December 6th. And uh, we will have several staff from several offices going. And if any board members wish or, or council wish to um, participate, just let, let me know and I'll connect you um, or, or reach out directly to Daniela Ramirez. Um, is that the fifth or the sixth? The sixth. sixth. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, our next agenda, I, that concludes the chair's report. The next agenda item is our executive officer's report on elections, unfair labor practice complaints and hearings presented by um, our executive officer, Santiago Villa Gomez. Good morning, Chair Hasid again and members of the board. I am going to be speaking a little bit slower. I know our interpreter is doing a terrific job keeping up. Uh, just as a reminder for folks to modulate your voice speed to uh, help her. Um, turning to the report itself, it's not yet posted to the website. It will be uh, later this afternoon. However, uh, there are two, two official reporting items and then two that I'll mention. So the first is uh, the complaint settled in Foley Family Farms. And that case number is 2023-CE-033-SAL. The general counsel filed its motion to take off calendar due to settlement. And that was filed on October 22nd. So that matter is now taken off calendar and it involved the complaint filed in Sonoma, or I'm sorry, filed against Holy Family Farms, LLC, which grows grapes in Sonoma County. And that complaint had issued on August 2nd of this year. Next, decisions issues. There were no administrative orders issued. There were, however, uh, a decision issued in DMV Packing Corp to in business as Tamari Company. And that decision is 2024. And then the citation is 50 ALRB number two. Case number is 2023-RM001-VIS. They're a certification of the labor organization issued on October 23rd. And it had been set, the objections had been filed by the employer. The board had set it for objections hearing, an IHE decision issued, and the Responded that I'm sorry, the employer then filed exceptions to the decision, which the board considered. And ultimately, the board dismissed the exceptions to the decision and overruled the objections to the certification. So that matter, as of right now, is final. The next two items uh, relate to complaints. We don't yet have uh, filings to take off calendar. However, for both of the uh, matters. The general counsel has indicated that they will do so shortly because they have entered into, uh, parties have entered into settlement. The first is J&G Berry Farms, LLC, and California Giant, Inc. And that matter number is 2022-CE-018-SAL et al. We were advised on October 22nd that they have settled and then Norman's Nursery, Inc., that case number is 2022-CE-010-VIS. We heard from the general counsel on October 28th that that matter is settled. So we're waiting for the motions to take off calendar, but otherwise appear to have settled. That concludes my report. Happy to answer any questions about it. Thank you, Santiago. And um, thank you to our, uh, our acting uh, ALJs for helping uh, get these get these to settlement. Um, appreciate that. Um, next, we'll have our litigation report with Board Counsel Scott and Ziardi. Scott. Good morning, Chair C and members of the board. This will be the uh, litigation report on uh, litigation matters involving the board. I'm going to start with case number BCV-24-101649. In the Kern County Superior Court, this is Wonderful Nurseries LLC versus ALRB et al. Um, <clears throat> this is Wonderful Nurseries petition for writ of mandate and complaint. On October 3rd, 2024, the ALRB filed an answer to the complaint. Uh, on October 28th, 2024, the parties filed a joint case management conference statement in the case, and a case management conference is scheduled to take place on November 12th, 2024. The next matter is case numbers F0886632 and F0886639. This is ALRB versus Superior Court. Uh, consolidated petitions for writ of mandate filed by the uh, ALRB and UF United Farm Workers of America uh, challenging the Superior Court's denial of the ALRB of demurs to the complaint in the Kern County matter. On October 24th, 2024, the court on its own motion 
ordered the petitions for writ of mandate filed by the ALRB and UFW consolidated and ordered Wonderful for, to file a response to the petitions within 30 days, which would be Monday, November 25th, 2024. The replies of the ALRB and UFW would be due 30 days after the filing of the response. The final matter is case numbers F088515 and F088520. Uh, this is Wonderful Nurseries LLC versus ALRB Consolidated Appeals filed by the ALRB and United Farm Workers uh, appealing the Superior, the Kern County Superior Court's order granting preliminary injunction. Um, on September 23rd, 2024, the court ordered the appeals of the ALRB and UFW Consolidated. Wonderful filed its opposition to the petitions for writ of supersedious on October 7th, 2024. And on October 24th, 2024, the appellate court issued the writ of supersedious staying the preliminary injunction, injunction ordered by the Superior Court pending the appeal. Uh, that concludes my litigation report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, next, we have a question. Oh, yes. So um, is the effect of the granting of that writ that the hearing will resume? Yes. Okay. As will the MMC proceedings. Okay. Thanks. Okay, good question. Um, and next, uh, we have our general counsel's report with Julie Montgomery. Julie? I have a few settlements to report on, and, and I'll just give you a little highlight of one outreach event. The first settlement uh, is out of Region 2 uh, in Visalia area, and in that case, this was a, a pre-complaint settlement where three, three dairy workers in Hanford filed charges on March 28th of this year, alleging that they filed a BOFI claim, that's the Bureau of Field Enforcement with the Labor Commissioners, or, or with, with the D Division of Labor Standards Enforcement rather, uh, regarding systemic wage theft and, and a Cal OSHA complaint. Um, and they requested their personnel files and pay records, and they notified the dairy that they did file these claims. And then they were terminated, their pay was reduced um, a few months later, and then they were terminated um, a few months after that, which was in October of 2023 without a bonus. And so they alleged that was in retaliation for their participation in these uh, processes. And the parties reached a settlement agreement on October 1st of this year. However, the dairy did close um, during you know, the interim period. So the remedy only includes back pay to, um, to one worker to make him whole for, for lost wages, which is like $61. And, um, and then there'll be mailings. Um, but, but other than that, there's... Um, yeah, we, we can't do the, the, the standard noticing remedies as there's no workforce left to, to notice on that one. We also settled a charge against Bagdazarian Services, LLC, which is um, in the, the Coachella Valley. And in that case, a irrigation specialist was working in citrus and filed a charge in March of 2023, alleging that he was terminated that same month for complaining with coworkers a few days prior about a change in workplace cell phone policy. Or in fact, it was it was the day prior to being fired that that he uh, had complained. The parties reached an agreement on October 18th of this year, and it includes standard noticing and $22,345 in back pay and $1,000 payment in lieu of reinstatement to charging party as charging party's position was eliminated. We also reached a settlement involving with, with Fully Farms, which is a wine grape grower in Sonoma County. And that charge was filed by North Bay Jobs with Justice, which is a nonprofit organization in that area. And they filed their charge in September of 2023, alleging that the FLC owner 
uh, that Fuller had contracted with retaliated against a crew of eight workers who were picking wine grapes after they asked for a $1 raise and, and had started to take sick, sick days, their, their, their three paid sick days. Um, the FLC owner had requested that the foreman, um, you know, well, they discouraged workers from taking sick days, first of all, and then, and then also were, was requiring the foreman to take extra measures, um, against these workers to ensure that they were actually sick and staying home, which, which they hadn't done with other workers who, who hadn't engaged in protected activity. Um, and despite being assured work through harvest, the crews were terminated on in August of 2023. The general counsel found sufficient evidence that a violation occurred and filed a complaint on August 2nd. The parties reached an agreement um, on August, October 24th this year, so a couple of months after the complaint was filed. And it includes standard noticing terms, supervisor training, and $17,945 in back pay for the eight workers. And reinstatement was not part of the agreement as the workers were offered their jobs back shortly uh, after being terminated. So that that's it for settlements. And then um, just real quick on outreach, we participated, we had staff participating in a community meeting with the Central Coast Alliance United for Sustainable Economy cause in collaboration with Department of Pesticide Regulation, the city of Santa Maria, and, um, and I believe the Ag Agricultural Commissioner and Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment was also involved. And we had our attorney, Yesenia Pulido, and our outreach specialist, Noemi Gregorio, attending these events. The first day involved a community meeting where workers shared testimony about their working conditions, followed by a food distribution and traditional dance. And uh, they, our staff did a, did a presentation to, to workers about the ALRB. The second day, uh, they participated in what, what they called a toxic tour along with the team at a depart, you know, with the different, the different groups I mentioned. And the tour was guided by youth volunteers at CAUSE. And the tour included seeing a packing plant, tomato greenhouse, and schools surrounded by agriculture. Students shared testimony about the dangers and concerns that they about pesticide use. Um, and they also visited some school sites that were, were near fields. And workers shared um, stories of working in a plant um, and, and some experiences they had where, where uh, they faced retaliation and how the ALRB helped with their case. So that pretty much concludes my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. And thank you to the staff. Um, interesting to hear about the Foley Farms case um, where workers were discouraged from taking sick leave. I fear that that happens um, more often than not. So it's, uh, reassuring and I think that's a really important um maybe something we could highlight um to help raise awareness um and I'd love to hear more about the noticing of that or when that noticing may be um but yeah great do my colleagues have any questions or comments okay um we do not have an administrative services report or a legislative report today so our next agenda item is um an update from our regulation subcommittee and I will turn it over to board member Broad. Um, good morning, members, members of the public. Um, you have before you uh, our report and a proposed recommendation to take action today. Um, I, I want to point out a couple of things, and then I'll just go over the, the changes that we recommend. Um, the, the general rule is that um, parties need to comment on only the changes in the proposal. Um, they, they're not really supposed to go back to prior issues that were resolved by the board and not changed the last time. However, we have um, decided well, this in, in this iteration and our prior report to uh, address pretty much every issue that the parties raised 
regardless of whether it was an issue that um, you know should have been raised earlier um, because we want to be open, transparent, and responsive to uh, everyone's concerns. Um, that said, we actually are only um, recommending two small changes in the draft. Um, and let me go over those. They're really, they're substantive, but not major changes. And I don't doubt that they will be controversial, but you never know. So the first one is uh, a proposal to change regulation to proposed regulation 20391A1 on um, service of a petition on an agricultural employer. That provision allows uh, when personal service of the employer itself, its officers cannot be made, uh, cannot be accomplished to uh, in certain circumstances, serve it on the supervisor of the workers uh, that are um, covered by the petition. We had an, uh, one of the parties pointed out that, uh, and this was an error um, on our part because we had actually proposed it correctly in our in statement of reason, uh, but had, had the wrong language in the um, actual regulation language itself. And in the uh, last sentence, it says that if you if, if a, a party serves the petition on the supervisor, it still has to um, email or use or and use a courier to deliver it to the employer. And that should not be and, it should be or, so that they can serve it by email or notify the employer by email of the service or by personal courier. So that's the first change, changing the and to an or. And then the second one, which is in section uh, regulation 20391A4, um, uh, merely provides that when uh, the staff, um, as is required by the regulation, provides a notice to workers of, um, of the fact that a petition has been filed and is under investigation, that, um, that a copy of that uh, notice needs to be uh, given uh, provided to the union that filed the petition. Uh, obviously, the employer is posting it, so it has a copy of the notice um, already. So that's the second change, really uh, giving a copy of the notice to the union as part of that process. So those are the two changes that we are recommending. Uh, otherwise, the... the uh, regulations that we're proposing are unchanged, except for those two changes. Um, and that we're also recommending that we notice those for the minimum period of 15 days. So that, and with that, um, I guess we'll entertain any questions that um, folks have and uh, or maybe raised by the public. Do any of my colleagues have any questions? Neither do I. And then Santiago, can you let us know, do any members of the public or staff have any questions? I don't see any messages having been received prior to the meeting. So I'll put the call out now to members of the public and staff to raise their hand using the Zoom feature or to go off mute and indicate that they would like to make public comment. Doesn't look like anyone has an intent to comment at this time. Okay. Okay, great. Um, sure. I make a motion to approve the changes proposed in the report and move forward with the rulemaking. 
And the 15 day notice. Period. And the 15 day notice period. I'll second that. Thank you. <laughs> um, board member Flores. Aye. Board member Lightstone. Aye. Great. Okay. All right. So carry forward and hopefully we can get this thing off to OAL. Yeah. Let me just make a, um, this point. We, we, we will, I think, uh, the, the, I think the intention of the subcommittee will be at this point in the process that the comments, we're only going to entertain comments that deal with the two changes that we're proposing here. We're not going to be quite so liberal since we've <laughs> been very liberal so far. We're not going to, um, you know, general issues that are raised that aren't having anything to do with those two changes. We won't, we simply will not respond to. Um, so I just want to make that clear to everyone. Appreciate that. And thank you for all your work on that and to our council. And, and, and thanks to board council, Laura. And yes. Todd. Um, yes. Um, thanks. Okay. Next, um, we have an informational panel today. Um, and I will turn over to our um, staff member, Michaela, in just a moment. Um, so this is a panel on agricultural industry certification, and there will be a roundtable discussion. This is a topic that I have long been interested in, as there are, I think most of us are familiar with some um, like fair trade certifications or the organic um, California certified organic um, certification, but there are several um, that also include a component to have high road labor practices. And um, so we wanted to have a larger discussion on that and learn more. And so we have several guests with us um, today and uh, I will turn it over to Michaela. Yes, good morning, everyone, members of the board and public and ALRB staff. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to start by introducing our uh, one of our panel presenters and moderator, Christy Getz. Um, Christy Getz is an associate professor of cooperative extension and food systems in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at UC Berkeley. Trained as a sociologist, her applied research and extension program focuses on the political economy of food and agriculture with a focus on farm labor, the small farm sector, agricultural government and sustainability. Her current research projects include an assessment of cannabis regulations effects on California communities, a study of farm worker health and healthcare access in California, and an evaluation of California's farm to school incubator grant program. Christy also chairs the UCANR's California Communities and Food Systems Program team. Christy, I'll turn it over to you and you should be able to share your screen. Great, thank you so much. Let me see if I can uh, share this. And can you all see the slideshow? Yeah. Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Fabulous. Great. Well, thank you so much, Michaela, and the rest of the board for inviting me to join you. Um, as Michaela mentioned, my primary role today will be as a moderator for our panel. And just to start, I'd like to provide a little bit of context for our discussion, sharing some of the questions that colleagues and I have been contemplating and researching on and off for about 20 years. Um, so, so these larger questions are, first of all, what is a landscape of US market-based voluntary certification initiatives that address labor issues in the US agricultural sector? Um, what is the potential of these in initiatives to ensure labor rights? and increase social sustainability in agriculture? And how do market-based initiatives um, intersect with non-market strategies to ensure uh, that aim to improve labor conditions? And finally, what can we learn from in-depth site-based research on these initiatives? And so today our deep dive is gonna be into the Equitable Food Initiative. And I'm thrilled to have three fabulous panelists who you'll meet soon um, on this panel, but just, uh, kind of an intro, I wanted to touch base on question number one, which is just to give a little bit of a background on the landscape from my perspective, market-based certification initiatives, and then um, just briefly talk a little bit about some in-depth colleagues that I've done into EFI, which is short for equitable food market. Um, so I was inspired to start thinking about these questions back in 2001 not long after the National Organic Program failed to incorporate social standards, with the USDA basically telling farm labor advocates that social dimensions of organic agriculture were not in their purview. 
And so I think this was really an opening for some initiatives to emerge that would in fact incorporate social dimensions. And as researchers, we thought it was worth understanding and evaluating some of these approaches. And going back to the early 2000s, we found that these um, national initiatives seem to struggle with some a few key challenges. And one of those was a number of these initiatives were trying to simultaneously hold issues facing farm labor and issues facing small small farmers in the same space. And what we found early on is that for the most part, the farm labor issues were kind of subsumed by the small farm issues. And, and that kind of simultaneously holding those together was quite challenging. Um, similarly, in, in governance structures of these initiatives, um, labor seemed to take short thrift to some of the small farm and, and farm advocacy groups. Um, one notable exception early on to this was the Agricultural Justice Project, which is a, a very high bar niche initiative um, to, and they enrolled a, um, they, sorry, they basically developed a food justice certified label and they were able to achieve meaningful labor representation. But again, it's a very niche um, initiative. It's been in place now, it's still around for about 25 years. And they, um, at this point, have certified five farms in the United States with one right um, So fast forward to about 2011, um, three initiatives emerged at that time that began to attack the social dimension of U.S. agriculture in a more comprehensive way, um, a, incorporating the mainstream ag sector. And those are the Fair Trade USA, the Fair Food Program, and the Equitable Food Initiative. And all three of those had had and have very rights-based language and a commitment to centering social sustainability. Um, and while each has very different, uh, very different, a dis each has a very distinct focus, very distinct context and a very distinct theory of change, all explicitly recognize the need to target or engage retailers, sort of moving beyond the grower versus worker dichotomy. Um, and so fast forward to 2024, and these three initiatives are still, I, in my purview, the primary certifica certification initiatives um, in, in the United States, focusing on the labor intensive produce sector. And so I just want to give a very brief overview of these just to give a context for where kind of EFI is situated. Um, Fair Trade USA has a Fair Trade certified label. It was founded in 1998. It expanded into the produce sector internationally in 2004, and it certified its first US-based farm in 2011. And while it has strong rights-based language, really the central focus of Fair Trade USA certification, um, even here in the United States, is um, on the premium-based funding of community development projects. And that's really its central focus. Um, currently, Fair Trade USA has seven certified US producers in the produce sector, six of which are located in California. Um, the other one I want to mention is the Fair Food Program, which also kind of came on the scene in 2011 um, when the Coalition for Immokalee Workers, a worker-based human rights organization, launched the Fair Food Program and later its Fair Food Consumer Power Worker Certified Label with an initial focus on eradicating what they called modern day slavery in Florida. On, on Florida tomato farms. And while they have expanded beyond Florida and beyond tomatoes, their focus is really in the Eastern United States and the Southeast. And they only have one farm certified in California, which is actually in cut flowers. And then finally, as we're gonna learn more about today, the Equitable Food Initiative in 2011 launched its responsibly grown farm worker assured label and program. They, they do more than just certification. And currently they have, um, I, Peter, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. I think 25 US-based producers certified in the produce sector, mostly on the West Coast with nine in California. Um, EFI is unique in that it emerged from the labor movement and was co-founded by union leaders and has maintained deep and meaningful engagement with farm labor groups, including ongoing representation from the three largest farm worker unions in the United States. Colleagues and I, Ron Strolik and Maria Echeveste, um, were fortunate to receive funding from the Berkeley Food Institute and the Packard Foundation about seven years ago to conduct research on EFI certified farms. So I just wanted to share a few quick reflections. Um, 
Um, so we were able to conduct focus groups with more than 80 farm workers and interviews with a wide variety of stakeholders stakeholders in EFI certified supply chains um, over a period of about a year. And I think the most notable finding for us was the importance of culture change on farms. And that was really somewhat surprising to us, um, but particularly the importance of this for women and indigenous workers. We noticed some marked shift in gender dynamics on these farms, market decline in sexual harassment, a decrease in toxic language and toxic communication, and other just reflections, we were impressed by meaningful attention to ethical treatment of guest workers, a decrease in the culture of fear on the workplace, and a real recognition on the parts of both workers and managers that farms function much better with collaborative team-based problem solving and communication. And um, this is just a, a photo of um, a leadership team, which is a cornerstone of the EFI program. It's a worker management team that does problem solving. And um, it's it's been really an interesting, inter it's been really interesting to learn about how these leadership teams function um, in the farm context. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this back to Michaela to introduce our panel and then we'll hear directly from them. Yes, thank you, Christy, so much for your introductory remarks. So I'll start by introducing our panel members. Um, I'm gonna start with Ernie Farley. Ernie has worked in the berry industry in California and Mexico since earning a degree from UC Davis and joined a and over 15 years ago. Ernie brings a vast knowledge of the retail environment as well as extensive networks within the grower shipper community. Ernie currently oper owns and operates Good Farms, which has farms throughout the state of California and which the board had the chance to visit, um, which was pretty amazing. Next, I'll introduce Eric Nicholson. Eric Nicholson has spent his life working in support of farm workers. He is the founding partner of Pandion Strategy, a consultancy focused on creating worker-centered solutions for agriculture. Eric is the interim executive director of the nonprofit Semillero de Ideas, which centers farm workers as the driver of much needed innovation in agriculture. Eric worked 18 years with the United Farm Workers and prior to that, 12 years with PCUN, a farmer farm worker union in Oregon. During his tenure with the UFW, he led four successful union campaigns at farms in Oregon and Washington state. He also co-founded Cierto, a nonprofit dedicated to the identification, training, and dispatch of agricultural guest workers in an ethical and transparent manner. Finally, I'd like to introduce Peter O'Driscoll. Peter is the executive director of the Equitable Food Initiative, a nonprofit skill building and certification organization that improves working conditions, pest management, and food safety in the fresh produce industry. EFI works with major buyers, suppliers, workers, and consumer groups to provide greater assurance regarding supply chain conditions while generating measurable value for all stakeholders. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for being here today. I'm really excited to hear about our discussion. Christy, I'll pass it back over to you to kind of start things off. Great, thank you so much. So I think we're gonna start off with um, Peter presenting um, some history and context of what EFI has been up to and, and their approach. Thanks, uh, Christian, Michaela, and uh, good morning to the board members and other attendees. Uh, Chair Hasid, you may remember we had a good conversation about a year ago about EFI, so it's a pleasure to follow up here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and give a brief overview of uh, EFI, but I hope that as much as possible, this can be uh, a conversation uh, with our colleagues. Uh, Eric Nicholson was the first chair of the board of EFI and Ernie Farley is the current chair of the board. So I think uh, we're looking forward to your questions and comments. Uh, I'm just gonna give you now the background. Let me know if you can uh, see my screen. Yes, we, we, can. Yeah, we can see it. Excellent, thank you. So uh, EFI was founded, as, as mentioned, uh, actually going back to about 2008, uh, through a series of what we call strange bedfellow conversations among unlikely uh, participants from across uh, the industry, uh, and began to actually uh, operate its programs in about 2011, as Christy mentioned. Uh, the goal was to really improve wages and working conditions throughout the fresh produce industry. Uh, we were looking at a landscape that I'm sure is very familiar to all of you. Um, the labor shortage is a huge issue, uh, not only in California, but in throughout the United States and Mexico. Uh, it's led to increased dependence on H2A guest worker programs and so forth. Uh, and many uh, employers will, will are particularly concerned about the rising cost of labor and uh, the threat to the domestic industry on the basis of uh, imports. 
Uh, as Christy also mentioned, a huge factor in this industry is retail consolidation, concentration among the largest retailers. The impact of that phenomenon is, of course, downward price pressure on the supplier, and the only place they have to go uh, is to wages. And so there's an inherent or increasing tension as suppliers get a smaller and smaller share of the food dollar from the retail sector. Uh, on the other hand, though, uh, the retail sector has its own concerns, um, principally continuity of supply. The concern for them is, are we going to have enough of the produce we want uh, on the shelves when we want it? They recognize that there are multiple uh, threats to that, including labor violations and the recognition that they have responsibility for supply chain conditions. Food safety is a huge concern, which is one of the reasons EFI uh, began with a focus on engaging the workforce in reducing risks to foodborne illness. Um, but obviously, if they're concerned about long-term uh, continuity of supply, the viability of the produce industry in this country is a major concern. How long can growers stay in business given the price pressures and other factors? Uh, at the same time, and again, as Christy referenced, there's been a growing consumer demand for more transparency uh, with the rise in reporting on labor violations, human trafficking, and so forth. Consumers at least express uh, an interest in knowing more about the conditions in which their food was produced. And last, but by no means least, uh, given the labor shortage, there's a, 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 an understandable boom uh, in investment in uh, mechanization, automation, and other uh, forms of agricultural technology. Um, our position on that is that uh, we will never replace labor in the fields with robots, uh, that the best approach to uh, ag tech is to make sure that we can professionalize and upskill the existing farm labor force so that we can maximize the benefits of any digital or automation advances in the sector. For EFI, the question was always uh, not just how do we make things better for the workers, but how do we drive systemic change that is sustainable because it is responsive to the interests of all the key stakeholders? So what you see here is a recognition that each of the four major stakeholder groups has their own interests. EFI's goal is not to get them together to agree on everything. Uh, as you can see from this Venn diagram, we accept from the start that they will disagree about most things, and that's okay. The question is, can we identify areas in which their interests actually align and work out of that space? So the premise of EFI from the beginning was, if we could uh, train and incentivize workers to minimize uh, labor violations, to address food safety risks at the point of production, we would create a higher value product for, the, for their employer. Uh, we could generate some or return some of that additional value to the worker. We would be meeting the needs of the retail sector for supply chain sustainability and transparency, and thereby offering the consumer a product that, was, uh, that met their supposed demand for greater transparency and ethical production. And we set out to build a program that could accomplish those goals. Uh, it began with uh, the strange bedfellow dialogue that uh, I referenced. And I, I hope that Ernie and Eric uh, will share some of their experiences from those early years of trust building and disagreement uh, that led to the foundation of the program. We've tried to sustain the program throughout on the basis of ongoing interest-based dialogue uh, conditions change over time. Uh, interests may change over time. Uh, the board of EFI continues to represent um, that combined multi-stakeholder approach, and the work of the board is to maintain that interest alignment. And perhaps most importantly, all of the work that we do is predicated on the understanding that workers are skilled professionals and that the more we can document and enhance the skills they bring to this work, the more likely we are to find sustainable solutions in the long term. The first program that we tried, and again, Christy gave you that background, was uh, a certification program. And you see the Responsibly Grown Farm Worker Assured label. Uh, the basis of that was, first of all, what we considered to be the most rigorous standards in the industry. Uh, Eric and Ernie can speak to you about the three-year negotiation process among those stakeholder groups that it took to agree on the wording of labor, food safety, and integrated pest management standards. 
Second, as Christy also referenced, the core of the program is the formation training of a worker manager leadership team. Uh, we provide them with foundational skills in communication and problem solving. And initially, we set them up to bring their farms into compliance with our standards. Over time, we've learned that the skills that they have and the trust that they've established can be applied to the resolution of business problems as well as standards compliance. And that, in turn, has increased the value proposition, if you will, to employers. The results of that training would be a third party audit, uh, eventually leading to certification that would allow uh, the, the grower to use the responsibly grown label on their product. And most importantly, uh, given the limitations of audits, we're all familiar with the limitations of audits, which are essentially a snapshot of conditions on the day the auditor arrived. The goal was that this leadership team would continue to function throughout the year between the initial audit, the verification audits, such that as and when uh, problems arise, and they will, EFI is not a guarantee of perfection. We expect things to go wrong on our farms, and they do. The question is, have we created a culture on the farms in which workers feel empowered and safe to raise their hands when they see uh, violations or non-compliances with the standards? such that the leadership team can employ its skills to resolve and address those concerns. As of now, uh, over the last 10 years, since we first certified in 2014, we're working on 53 operations in four countries, Canada, the US, Mexico, and Peru. Uh, there are another 11 farms that we hope to certify over the next six to eight months. Um, there are more than 50,000 workers uh, on farms with trained and certified EFI leadership teams across those four countries. And as Christy referenced, one component of our program is a retail paid certification, uh, excuse me, a retail paid worker bonus. So uh, Costco and Whole Foods are the largest retailers that participate and pay a premium that ranges from one to four cents per pound, depending on a commodity. 87% of that additional premium payment goes right back into the pockets of workers. 3% uh, stays with the employer for administrative cost, and 10% comes back to EFI as our licensing fee for the use of the label, which in turn uh, funds the expansion of our program. Um, we can talk a lot as much as you want about the certification, but I do want to simply uh, point out to you that part of our evolution has been the recognition that certification programs, whether ours or some of the others that Christy mentioned, in our wildest dreams will perhaps reach the top 10% of the produce supply chain. And the question that has been asked of us from day one is, well, what are you doing to address labor violations and challenges throughout the other 90% of the supply chain. Uh, for California, that's hundreds of thousands of farmers who will never have access either to a legally binding uh, collective bargaining contract or a certification program. And so over the past six or so years, we've been trying to diversify programs that begin to address the rest of the industry. Um, I'll talk in a moment about the Ethical Charter Implementation Program, but EFI has taken some of the training that we use with leadership teams and turned it into uh, mass market seminars and workshops and online courses that introduce any employer anywhere in the industry to some of the concepts of workforce engagement, continuous improvement, uh, labor management collaboration, and so forth. Uh, we train trainers who are employed by employers to bring some of those concepts into their employment and in, into their workplace, regardless of whether they're EFI certified or not. Um, we certify, obviously, and in the state of California, in collaboration with the California Workforce Development Board, several other state agencies, and a, a multi-stakeholder collaboration of employers and worker organizations, we're in the process of floating now a formal uh, a credentialing program uh, to recognize farm worker skills that we think will be a big part of the long-term future of the industry. I referenced there the Ethical Charter Implementation Program, and I'll briefly say that this is a collaboration with six of the largest buyers in the industry, along with a number of suppliers, many of them based in California, which is an effort to recognize um, that the supply chain challenges throughout the industry are significant. Many of you will be familiar with a report in the LA Times 10 years ago 
about labor exploitation in Mexico. It led the produce industry in 2018 to publish uh, a document called the Ethical Charter on Responsible Labor Practices. I'd encourage you to look at that document, uh, ethicalcharter.com, and to see the commitments that the industry at the retail and supplier level made to labor rights and working protection, or worker protections. Um, EFI decided that we wanted to challenge the industry to go beyond uh, written promises to, to formal implementation. And so we piloted a series of strategies starting in 2021 that might uh, go beyond simple endorsement of that charter towards meaningful implementation. Uh, last year, we introduced the Ethical Charter Implementation Program, uh, and a year in, we now have 261 produce companies who have subscribed to a continuous improvement capacity building program, um, and six major buyers who are now uh, expecting their suppliers to report regularly on the measures they are taking to strengthen labor management systems at field level throughout their supply chain. Um, that program, the Ethical Charter Implementation Program, as I say, integrates the participation of major, major buyers who are proudly now uh, reporting to their customers um, their participation in the program. Uh, we are uh, coordinating closely with the International Fresh Produce Association because they are the owners of the Ethical Charter. And we hope to expand this program in the coming year to include not only farm labor contractors, but also workers themselves. We hope to create a worker portal where workers can learn about the protections that they are offered by the Ethical Charter and assess the degree to which their employers are implementing the required management systems. And then finally, as I mentioned, we have been piloting for the last several years a program in the state of California that is designed to uh, achieve a formal farm worker credentialing system to be recognized not only by the state, but also by uh, private industry. Uh, we're in the process of documenting agricultural skills, building another multi-stakeholder collaboration among state agencies, employer groups, uh, worker organizations, and so forth, such that we can agree on a common approach to curricula and assessment processes that will result in formal credentials for the agricultural workforce. I just want to end now by referencing, as has been said by a couple of you, uh, that this past month, uh, several members of the board and staff uh, from ALRB were able to interact with a leadership team uh, and employers uh, at a Good Farms location in Oxnard, California. And, um, you know, for someone like me to come along and talk about the impact of EFI, I think is much less uh, powerful uh, than to hear from the colleagues who actually had a chance to listen and talk to workers themselves. So I hope at some point in this, uh, perhaps after we've heard from Eric and Ernie, I'd really appreciate it if the board members who were present for that trip would share some of their uh, reflections on uh, what they heard from workers. And with that, uh, I will stop. Apologies for going on for too long, but I hope uh, you can uh, hear now from Eric and Ernie. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. So um, I have uh, some questions that I would love Ernie and um, and Eric and, and you, Peter, as well, to weigh in on, unless um, Ernie or Eric, you have anything you'd like to say first, or should I dive into my questions? So go ahead with your questions, Christy. Great. I will. So, um, so Eric, I'd like to start with you um, going back to sort of the origins of the Equitable Food Initiative back when you were wearing the UFW hat. I'm wondering if you could talk about back then sort of what was the motivation for, for the union sector to, to engage or in, engage in this type of initiative? Um, well, I'll just say that I just on the record, I am not speaking for the UFW. Um, I have had the honor of working with them for 18 years, but four years out on my own. So the opinions I'm offering are my own. Um, we wanted to do more by farm workers. I, I don't see this as any different than the historic struggle that the union has fought for overtime for all farm workers, for heat stress regulations for all farm workers, smoke protections up here where I am in the Pacific Northwest, and recognizing the trends that Peter spoke of, where from our perspective, the retailers or consumer facing brands are some of the most powerful, if not most powerful entities in our industry. And watching with increasing dismay, 
how they were unilaterally and continue to unilaterally decrease prices they're, they're uh, paying to growers that when we then go in and in my own experience in collective bargaining, the pie that we have to negotiate around diminishes. And the whole point of our, our, of our historic struggle in the union union movements, be it Flock or Pekun or the UFW, has been to increase wages and working conditions. So ideally all boats rise. I think that coupled with a recognition that the market with a capital M is punitive towards those employers, those agricultural employers that do better. And it's very easy to go out in, into the fields and talk to growers who will tell you that the um, social compliance folks for you pick the retailers, there's five that are now responsible for over 50% of all the food we buy in the US, come give them a pat on carbon reduction, good work with solar, or getting rid of plastics, um, or you know, having you know a union contract that provides paid medical and vacation, that's awesome. And then when the when the purchase order is issued, it goes to the, the bottom feeder that's doing none of this, that's openly flaunting wage and hour law with impunity, using some FLC that's engaged even more egregious behavior. And all of our all of us are left wondering, well, if this is so great, why aren't the purchase orders lining up? And then lastly, increased you know, demand from consumers of wanting to know what to buy. You know, the movement I'm probably part of the, of the union was born of telling workers what, or I'm sorry, consumers what not to buy, the boycotts. And that has really shifted to people really want to align their purchasing with values that are being implemented all the way down to the farm worker level. And so I'd say those were the three trends that, that from my perspective, gave birth to the EFI um, and, and the unions at the time coming together to, to help make it happen. Great, thank you so much. So. Um... I'd like to shift over to you, Ernie, now, um, you know, also kind of going back to the early days of EFI as a grower. Could you talk about your perspective on this and sort of also what you kind of see now as the, the hook for growers to get involved in, 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 in this initiative? Yeah, certainly. Thank you to you and to the board, et cetera, for your time and, and your interest. Um, yeah, I, you know, Originally, and because, you know, as as I say during our board meetings at EFI, I am a capitalist pig. You know, I have to call, you know, it fair that we're there for self-interest and a lot of the really strong work that I think the UFW and Pikun and Flock and the other and Pan and everybody else did was bringing those retail customers to the table that then me as a grower went like, oh, gee, you know, not, this is this is a, a little more of a safe zone and and an interest in mind because that what you know that is my or our customer and that really did sort of change the the view with me and my business partners and our teams you know like that we we needed to take some risk to get involved because there was something there were people that were thinking differently and you know credit goes to those to that group um that they were really thinking differently and and it has be it, it is a lot of hard work because the organizations that, that we're referring to are massive organizations, you know, some of them larger than our U.S. military, and getting them to change is, is, is difficult, not, not necessarily from a, like, they don't want to change, it's just difficult to change humongous organizations and get, get you know, things moving, etc. Um, and I, you know, I, I guess... I know we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff, but I, I think a lot of it too was a cult. Once that thing got created, there was a lot of culture change amongst our organizations that, that involved a lot of moving, removing bricks from a wall. I think all of us from my, our point of view, as well as the NGOs and unions point of view, we all had, we all had perceptions of who the other was and it took a lot of time, a lot of risk um, and bravery from all the organizations to pull those bricks down and go to that middle part that Peter was talking about where you can create change. Um, one of the founders, founding, you know, Yodas, if you will, of EFI was a gentleman, uh, Jeff Lyons, who's retired now. He was an executive vice president at Costco. And he always used to tell us, you know, to be right is easy. You know, all of the things that we all feel in our heart is, are important. That they that is true, but then to create change is very difficult. 
And I think EFI has become a really good tool to, to, to begin that work of grabbing the shovel and creating the change. We all agree farm workers deserve more money. Okay. Well now, now what? Right. So those are, those are, that's where we really see EFI being a wonderful tool to begin those really difficult processes of creating the change. Thank you. And I'd like to follow up when thinking about change and culture change. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of bringing this down to the micro level. Like what, what did that change look like on like one of your farms? Like what, like what was that process like of, of shifting the culture? Yeah. Changing culture. Yeah. Like I wish if there was a process boy, then I think I'd be a billionaire. The, 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 Changing culture is is just an incredibly difficult, arduous slog of building trust that we call it the ability to raise a hand. Like if if we can get people to be able to say, I have the I have empowered myself to be able to raise a hand and say something positive or negative, then you can begin the path of changing things but it's really that it's really hard but it's really it, it, it's that changing the it's just uh, you know i'm sorry but it's just a lot it's a lot a lot of work of building a trust with everyone that says uh, for instance just for instance peter points out we don't call our leadership teams leadership teams gee why well because when we did then everybody thought, well, that means I'm a leader, right? And then we had all of this problem with everybody. Well, I'm the leader. Well, you're the leader. So we changed them to call them uh, continuous process improvement teams, right? Well, that that's sort of a little example of the 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 way you you know it's it changing of like, look, look, we're not here to be a leader. You are a leader, but but it's really for us to continually pr change the processes to improve them. So anyway, that. I'm not giving you an answer, uh, really, that you probably want to hear, but no, it's it's all, all good. I mean, it's, it's a lot and a lot of uh, on the ground um, shifting things. So appreciate it. But so let me take a stab at it, if it's okay. Please. So I, I think one of the things, the key things we did is we we changed the nature of the job, right? And so just riffing off of I've had the pleasure of being on Ernie's farm many many times. And that in the early days, workers would show up and the job that they were doing was to pick as many berries as quickly as possible to maximize the day's return. And that was the job. And so with the EFI, we said, actually, we're proposing a different job. Your job is to produce a safer, more justly uh, grown strawberry for Costco consumers. And that includes you assuming as a worker responsibility for ensuring the berries you pick are not in proximity to deer poop or other food safety uh, uh, risks. That also means the worker then needs to assume the knowledge and the responsibility to just understand what those risks are, as Ernie says, call them out. And then the workers rightly said, okay, if that's what you want, what, what's in it for me? Because I'm not doing this for the same money of just picking strawberries, right? Because I already got that deal. And that's where we kind of, as, as Ernie talked about, then went to Costco and said, okay, if you want a safer, more justly produced berry, that is possible, but there needs to be an ROI for the workers and an ROI for the producers who are going to assume that cost. Otherwise, this is a fool's errand. And I think that is still the culture change that is underway, because if you look at the amazing work Ernie and other EFI certified growers have done on their farms, it is truly amazing. Yet when those workers go back into their communities, it's somewhat bipolar because their, their family members, other community members, who do not have, who have not had the experience of working on EFI certified farms, saying you're a fool. Don't do that. Keep your head down. Shut up. Pick everything you can. Put some stones in there. Get the. I mean, everybody knows the game of how you how you maximize maximize your return, uh, picking piece rate, right? And so we still have that that dynamic of not culture shift can happen at farms, and and I think EFI has done some amazing things. We still have work to do as as a community, as an industry, to get there. Fabulous. Um, I'm curious if you could maybe talk to us, this is open to any of you three, of the mechanism for growth in, in EFI in terms of the certification program. Is it is it that retailers are on board and they're kind of recruiting their growers into the program? Or are you recruiting growers directly? Or could you talk a little bit about how you're bringing um, partners on board as you continue to grow? 
So let me take a first stab at that and say that I think there are limits to growth. Um, mm -hmm. And and that's a very real thing. I don't think any of us is here to tell you that certification is, uh, you know, the panacea uh, or the or the you know, the, the, what everybody should be focused on. Uh, and the limits to growth are, for example, I referenced the, the work that Costco and, and Whole Foods and some other retailers or, or major buyers do to pay that additional uh, return on investment to, to, to growers and to workers. But there are plenty of large retailers that don't pay that premium, and that limits the incentive for, for new certification. Uh, certification is hard. Um, you've heard Ernie talk about you know how hard culture change is and uh efi you know there's there's other labels you can slap on your product that don't require <laughs> training and workforce you know worker manager collaboration and other things um so there are some real uh, structural limits to uh to, to expanding so we continue to grow i think in large measure because uh you know less and less because growers see um, you know, a, an economic advantage to getting certified and more and more because in a tight labor market uh, where the challenge of attracting a scarce workers is growing, um, the culture change argument actually becomes maybe more and more important. Uh, you know, we've got folks who are coming to us because they recognize that the status quo doesn't work and they're looking for new models. Right. Uh, yeah. It, it, can I add something to that? I, I think some of it, EFI and now the ESIP programs have created, and some of the other certification programs have created some tools to begin that change from the word farm worker to agricultural professional. And I think a lot of what's happened is post COVID, a lot of the very, very large food buying organizations had some real eye openers about the surety of the supply chain. And they've begun to realize they need to understand from a deeper perspective the 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 their supply chains and the and one of the main things being agricultural labor in their supply chain so i think the growth of these programs has started to come from the the buying side realizing hey one thing that we can see is we can draw a direct line from somebody who's trying to be progressive in their relationship with everyone in the in the food chain and the ability for them to deliver safe consistent food which is a really really important part of you know my business because i own a really huge grocery store chain or food service chain right thank you um so i'm going to ask you guys a million dollar question which is um in theory um Certification, EFI certification, and collective bargaining are compatible. Um, as you, it's a central component of your of your social standards is the right to collective bargaining. Um, question: Why do you think there are no unionized EFI farms, and do you anticipate that there could be a unionized EFI farm one day? And that's to anybody, any any of the three of you. Uh, I, I can take it. I don't know if those guys don't want to. Uh, the answer is uh, yes. I think there'll, there'll be, I, I kind of in some ways say, yeah, sh whatever. Yeah. Um, I've, I've managed farms that have had, uh, you know, ag uh, collective bargaining Bargain. units and I've managed farms that, that don't. I, I think where I have learned is, you know, just like, you know, Everyone has a different way they want to run their life. And I just think one of the things we need to look is the perspective of, you know, not all farm workers necessarily want a collective bargaining unit speaking for them. So this is just, a, it, and that's not a bad thing. Collective bargaining units aren't a bad thing. Either is EFI. It's just another tool for individuals to say they'd like to use to empower themselves in their workplace. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. There, there could be either as I think the bottom line is it's a tool to create a situation where a farm worker can empower themselves in the workplace to, amongst a lot of things. So whether it's a collective bargaining unit or whether it's a, a certification, I do think it's a good thing to have different products because there are so many people out there that have so many different opinions and it's good to have those products that will work for different personalities. Christy, if I can just 
add to that. Uh, it was my honor to be invited to speak at the United Farm Workers Convention in Bakersfield last month. Oh, and awesome. the, uh, about EFI and to, and to update their membership, uh, UFW obviously, as, as Eric mentioned, was instrumental in, in founding EFI. And I provided an update on, on some of the same programs we've discussed today. And the first line of my presentation was that uh, there is no stronger form of legal protection for worker rights than a collective bargaining contract. Um, you know, that's the easy thing to say. No, you know, it's not it's not a controversial thing to say. Um, but, you know, as to the future of unionization on EFI farms, I, I don't know, because our reality, and this probably won't surprise anybody on this call, is that some of the some of the challenges that I deal with come from uh, the grower community who openly call EFI a Trojan horse for unionization. Some of them come from the left who deride EFI as fair washing or as a union avoidance strategy. So um, where you stand depends on where you sit. <laughs> um, I can. It's not hard to understand why different people take whatever perspective they take. Um, I go back to what Ernie said, I'm old enough. I've been working with Landis agricultural workers since 1987 in Central America, where they were displaced by a civil war. I want results for those workers. I, certification is a means to an end. Collective bargaining is a means to an end. I'm interested in the end, and I'm interested in accelerating any and all strategies that achieve the end of dignified working conditions, fair wages, and respect for the skill involved in agricultural work. Wonderful. And I think that is a perfect place to wrap up our internal discussion here and open it up. We have a few minutes left for um, the board or the public to um, chime in with any questions of your own. And also, I welcome any reflections on the board's visit. So opening it up. Well, thank you so much, Christy. And, and thank you, our panelists. And I see Cynthia, you raised your hand. So you go ahead. Um, just want to say thank you very much for taking the time for this dynamic presentation and conversation. Um, also want to say uh, thank you so much for having and inviting us onto Good Farm a couple of months ago. Um, I had a fantastic visit um, and and learned quite a bit about EFI and um, to to the question that was posed to the attendees of, of the tour. I think um, in, in communicating and, and kind of just talking with some of the workers that were present, um, there was a, a clear um, distinction in terms of, I, I think, the way that they um, expressed themselves, not only about the benefits that they were receiving visa, via the, the trainings in, in terms of their kind of just work experience, but how those leadership skills also translated to other parts of their lives and um, it, it including kind of participation in their community, right? Taking on leadership roles in um, civil society. And so that was something that was quite, um, it, it, it was very impactful to hear. Um, and so I'll say that, I guess, um, I do have a question, um, just thinking about the kind of a strategies that are, are being used to educate consumers about EFI and um, communicating or tracking the, the impact that EFI is having at large. And so how to, how to effectively communicate um, some of the, the changes or impact that people are having um, and, and, and communicating that, what are the strategies that are being employed? I'll just quickly say we have a fabulous uh, marketing team. Uh, EFI is, is small but mighty. Uh, I wish there were more folks on that team. Um, but I think they've done a really, really good good job of communicating, um, you know, language that I never used to use in, in my professional career uh, around value propositions to different stakeholders. Um, but I, I also want to just say... Um, I don't think EFI is primarily focused for all that we have a consumer facing label. I don't think we see consumers as the engine of change in the near term. 
Um, consumers will all say 70, 80, 90% of them, yes, I'd happily pay a dollar more for a clamshell of strawberries if I knew that the workers were treated better. That doesn't translate at the cash register. And there's plenty of evidence to that effect. So I don't, you know, as important as it is to educate consumers, I think the real opportunity that we have is educating the, the, the merchants, the buyers at these large retail companies, and, and kind of to Eric's point, integrating into their procurement decisions, labor as a factor, right? Merchants buy on the basis of price, quality, and continuity of supply. Now, more and more, they have to look at food safety because recalls are expensive. We want labor to be one of those factors. And in fact, the Ethical Charter Implementation Program is all about essentially ranking suppliers based on the degree to which they can demonstrate engagement with the principles of the Ethical Charter. So as important as it is to tell stories, and again, I hope you'll look at equitablefood.org. I think there's some great material on there. There are some fabulous videos of farm workers that have actually gone viral. Oh thought that you could get a viral video of farm workers discussing their work, but my, my colleagues have achieved that. But I think the locus of change, and, and going back to Eric's point uh, from the very beginning, is how do you change retail buying behavior? Thank you. Um, so uh, I actually, in an earlier part of my career, worked on this issue internationally regarding slavery and human trafficking and supply chains and I and um, certification is a very complicated and difficult proposition and you alluded to one of the problems which is you've got <laughs> low rent producers and you can also have low rent certifiers and they will emerge to give people cover um, so it's I, I recognize how complex and difficult this is. And I really applaud you for you know, what you're doing. The conclusion I reached is that, is that private sector solutions to this can only go so far. And that there probably needs to be a role for government at some level to make sure in some way to guarantee that the standards that are being demanded don't go below a, a, a certain level. In other words, that you're not in competition with another certifier that will simply certify just about anybody that is breathing. And um, that is certainly what's happened in the international space. And so, um, and I'm, you know, and you alluded to it and I'm sure you're familiar with it. So. Uh, and I've thought about it. So what do you think is the role for government? We're government and we're uh, obviously concerned with that. And I, I, I wonder how you all feel about that. I'll take that one. Um, I agree with you in theory. I, I think I would just go back to Ernie's comment. It's easy to be right. Um, I'm still waiting for government to be impactful. There are situations where that's happening more regularly. But shoot, all we got to look to is California and the first heat stress reg, right? And we fought mightily to get that passed, only for it not to be enforced. And that's been our legacy over and over and over again, where we work, you know, do as much as we can moving heaven and earth to get the government to take action, implement you know, rules, policies, laws, only for enforcement to fall apart. And so I think it, there's not a silver bullet. It would be wonderful if government was much more out there and engaged, but we can't wait. And I think that's kind of the urgency coming from the labor movement that we brought to this effort is like, okay, in the interim, what are we going to do? So EPA ref has repeatedly re refused to implement measures to protect pesticide applicators, uh, implementing you know, things that we've done in California, cholinesterase testing and implementation of closed systems for, for high tox pesticides. We have that in our regs. And so what we've done is we've gone to the retailers and said, just as Ernie and, and Peter have said, okay, if, you, if sugar content so important, if the size of the fruit so important, the color so important, that's wonderful. So should be taken in consideration labor standards. And if we can get companies like Walmart and Kroger's and Albertsons to implement, and hold them accountable to the market. It's not just a fine that becomes part of the, the cost of doing business, but it's your ability to, to keep that purchase order intact or not. That's real power. 
So I think we really need to have a, a, the momentum of government truly engaging and truly holding industry accountable and the retailers in both are works in progress. Well, so let me ask you a follow-up question. Do you think then that uh, there is a role for government, and, and this would have to be done with legislation, but there is a role for government to create standards for certifying organizations um, by way of legislation or regulation? Um, I'll just say that there, though, you probably know this, those those uh, kind of harmonization efforts exist at the industry level, less so at the government level. Let, let me take an, another whack at this. I think there is a role for government. Um, it's been my uh, pleasure to to speak with several fairly high ranking whose na names I will not divulge at the, both the federal level and the California state government level about the challenge. And what they tell me consistently is that they simply don't have the budget for the kind of enforcement that they would like to do. And if there is a solution, and I'm not here to tell you what it is, uh, you're much more uh, skilled and experienced in this area than I am. But I do think it's bringing government to the table, right? Um, I think what we have done well is create the multi-stakeholder uh, dialogue space, not because we're the smartest uh, people in the room. I think we probably demonstrated to you already today that we're not the smartest people in the room, but because if we can get the right people in the room and facilitate the kind of conversation that needs to happen together, we could figure out a role for government in this space that is uh, maximizes impact. Um, I don't know immediately what that is. I doubt that it's a government regulation of certifications, but that's just an immediate gut reaction. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a way to coordinate enforcement efforts with certification efforts. And, I, and I, I, I very much hope that we can build that space where governments at the table with the major buyers, the consumer groups, the employer groups, and the unions uh, to figure out what that might be in this landscape. Thank you. And I understand um, from Santiago that um, another member of the public, Amalia, has their hand raised to speak. Yes, hi, I um, would like to introduce myself. My name is Amalia and I have the pleasure of working on on the farms with Ernie Farley. And to just to answer the question about auditing that was raised a few minutes ago, I would just like to say that within the EFI um, projects, um, uh, so, um, standards and so forth, it, there's a lot of education towards the entire workforce. So there's 40 hours of education for the process improvement team. But in addition to that, all of the farm workers are aware of their rights and their responsibilities and also the items that pertain to them and their safety. Like uh, Ernie said before, people are empowered to raise their hand when something doesn't look right. And the only reason they know that something doesn't look right is because they've received the training and the education and the understanding of what all of those rights and what EFI is. Um, as far as auditing is concerned, these farm workers, they don't wait for an audit to happen once a year. They become their own auditors because it is a farm worker led initiative and a farm worker led program where they are empowered. They empower themselves, like Ernie said, to raise their hand and say, you know what, there was a spray that happened in that field and now my supervisor is telling me that I need to go in there and harvest um, tomatoes, strawberries, cucumbers, whatever it is. But I know that it's not safe because the interval time has not concluded. So those are the types of learnings that they have and the why behind everything. So when somebody here mentioned about auditing, my answer would be farm workers lead the program and they audit their own program day to day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, one, uh, first off, just a comment. Ernie, really appreciate your comments about the challenge of culture change and um, your desire to, to, <laughs> to maybe come up with that billion dollar idea. I think there'd be many people that would uh, want to learn more about that and how to make it more effective. Um, one of my questions is, uh, have you found, um, and this is mainly directed for Ernie, but, but anyone can answer, 
have you found that the EFI certification has served as a good recruitment tool for your workforce? And, and have you heard about that one way or another? I'd be interested. Yes, yes it, it has. And, it, and it's, those are really hard to quantify. You know, it's almost more of a qualifying answer, but we have, we have seen that. And, and what it's also really helped us is a much more diverse group of people are coming to, to want to work at our farms because we're finding the, you know, the, the, the word out in the street, I'm coming, I'm, I'm cheese me, but uh, is uh, that, you know, it's, it's a much safer, it's a much more, it's a better place to work a for financial opportunity and B for your own safety and your own personal growth. Again, because EFI creates situations for people to empower themselves. Um, so yeah, we're, we're we are finally at that situation where we find that our recruitment and and the people staying is much much higher. That's and then it takes a while, but it does work. That's wonderful. Um, one of my other questions is how, in all of your experience, how have you found um, engaging kind of your frontline management, particularly supervisors, whether it's food safety? Because <laughs> so, we have so, found that's uh, like a really critical yeah, piece. So, to so, I, so Nicholson's <laughs> going to try to say this, but I'll say it already is what uh, I will admit, like I, he and I used to fight a lot. When we first started working to try to do this, sadly, we lost about 80% of those people. I mean, that was a long time ago, but we did. Um, and I'm not, I'm, that's not an indictment of anything other than ourselves. But yeah, it is really hard to do. And, and it's a process that, you know, I mean, again, this was 12 years ago, and I'm sure things have changed. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if Nicholson has the same comment, but that, yeah, that's think, super hard. I think you nailed it. There's two, to me, existential challenges that we have in the industry. One is how do we deal with the retailers who are not willing to pay a just price to, to growers and by extension to workers? And the other is frontline management. Um, you talk about culture change. You know, I've got a bunch of books about organizational design and startup behind me. And I like to tease people like Ernie and say, why isn't a single one of them start your business like a farm, right? I mean, some of the most antiquated, out of date structures and processes that one can imagine. And so when you go to a farm and start inviting workers to share their thoughts and their opinions, like Amali said, that's not how supervisors have learned. They've learned to humiliate, belittle, physically, uh, you know, or, or, or verbally intimidate or hurt people. That is the management structure of agriculture writ large. Right. And so until we redesign that position and find different people who have different inherent qualities, it's not a training issue. It's a job design issue that we need to be much more systematically about addressing um, you know, the challenges. And I, I applaud Ernie for having the courage to purge 80 percent of his workforce. I mean, I'm sorry, his management. Many producers aren't willing to go there because they're terrified not having their loyal field supervisors. They're going to lose control of the farm. And so I think being able to thread that needle is really one of the, the biggest challenges we have right now in agriculture outside of the retail consolidation issue. So great question. Yeah, I was going to say good question that you, you got right to the one of the hearts of the matter. We offer um, one of our remedies is to offer supervisor training. And then I, I know our staff have done that on a volunteer basis. And I really encourage industry to take advantage of it. I know some of the local I've seen Western Center um, here at UC Davis also offers, comp, you know, free frontline supervisor training after hours. I've seen that locally here in Woodland even, and um, just encourage folks to take advantage of that because I think that's got to be a really hard, hard thing to accomplish. Um, another question I had was of the of the pillars: the food safety, integrated pest management, and the labor relations piece. Um, I appreciate what you said, Peter, about how EFI, you know, you're not trying to get any, to change anyone mind, anyone's mind, just find those common areas of agreement. What was the hardest sector of those three things to find common areas of agreement? 
Oh, my goodness, where to start? I mean, actually, I, I think that's really more for Ernie and, and Eric, because in, in a sense, the negotiation of those standards was really the work that they did from their stakeholder positions. Um, so uh, I think, yeah, Eric and Ernie, what do you think? I mean, there, there's such a long list. I don't know. And, and er, Ernie can tell you that some of our most contentious conversations come every time we try to update the standards, right? We're all constantly trying to make them more effective and rigorous. And those interests clash and clash. So, but yeah. yeah. I, I, for me, I think it was labor and I, I'm not sure it was the substantive work as it was the relations because sadly our industry has generations of built up perceptions of each other that have created a lot of distrust on both sides of that view and the the work itself probably wasn't really that hard it was much more of taking away the bricks to, to begin to trust each other of like well we do do that no you don't or well that's actually a good idea i don't know eric what your thought was but i that that i there was just a lot of bad blood if you will that had to be removed <laughs> Well, no, I think Ernie, you nailed it. It was getting, creating the space of understanding the why behind the different positions, right? I mean, you know, I, coming out of the UFW, I, I did a survey when I was in leadership of how many people came to the union to collaborate with growers, raise your hands, right? Not a single one of us. That's not why we're, we, we come to labor. We come to fight the bad employers that are doing egregious things to the farm worker community that we care deeply about. And so when we come across people like Ernie or others in the EFI, it's like, wait a minute. You're, you look like them, but you're acting and sounding very, very differently. And it took a lot of internal, as, as Ernie talked about, culture shift me personally and with the organization to say, okay, the bottom feeders are there. We definitely got to deal with them and do what we got to do. But here's a different opportunity. And how can we recognize that these growers are not trying to get over on us, but they have a different perspective of the truth than we do by nature of our, of our position in the industry? And that, to me, has been one of the coolest things about the EFI board is instead of having coming from a position that I, because I was an elected officer, know everything about ag and ag labor, I have my perspective based on my lived experience. Ernie has his, Jeff Lyons from Costco, the food safety people, and look at how do we integrate that into a synergistic approach that transcends the experience that, that each of us bring. That's the really cool space. But getting to that space and getting out of the transactional positional um, arguments that we're really good at doing, we've got the binders, we know how to go at that, you guys know that better than we do on the board, um, and getting to that, that problem-solving, creative, in iterative space, I think, was the real challenge. And I see Jessica, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I wanted to comment after your comment, Victoria, about the supervisor training, because I think it was more than six to seven years ago in Ventura County, um, we had an investigation of a charge at one of the Good Farms locations, and it was um, dismissed. And in the conversation with management um, and the executive team there about what we are investigating and what the law covers and what it doesn't cover, um, they became very interested and invited us to do a supervisor training to all of their supervisors um, because they found that the information was useful. And um, we've had different communications with um, the grower entities that are part of Good Farms throughout the Central Coast. Um, and they've always been very um, primed, I guess, if you will, to take us up on the opportunity to do voluntary supervisor training there. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it, it speaks to the culture that exists um, from what I've seen. Um, and that culture, you know, culture from the top definitely seeps down throughout the organization um, to frontline managers. And I think we see that as this example was a very positive, proactive one. And um, oftentimes in our investigations, um, we see other cultures that do kind of uh, reinforce, if you will, some of the negatives that have been spoken about of how um, the industry and culture views farm workers and labor. So I just wanted to share that with you all and um, thank you for being some of the first that, that voluntarily brought us in to do those trainings. And I think um, it created a good working relationship as well. 
Jessica, can I just quickly follow up to say that um, Ernie introduced himself as a capitalist pig at the beginning of this uh, conversation. And from his perspective, um, he would say that for the first 25 years of my career, I came very much from the socialist perspective. So we were set up to argue. Um, the reason that I came to trust and respect Ernie and his colleagues was precisely because he never tried to tell us uh, that things were perfect on his operation. He was willing to acknowledge where things weren't working and to get about the business of fixing them. And I think it's that mentality uh, that has enabled his operation to grow, but it's the similar mentality that makes for a good candidate for EFI certification. I don't have any other questions. I don't know, Santiago, um, if you're able to see if there's anyone else with a hand up or if there's any comments or questions. Not at this time. Well, my colleague Barry has okay. a question. Okay, how how um how successful have you been in um, recruiting the industry trade, the ag industry trade trade associations like the Farm Bureau and so forth? Have they been willing to participate in this or send representatives or? Um, can, can I answer that just with a snarky comment, Peter? Because Peter, <laughs> Peter has Peter has given his life over the last decade of years to try to, and has stretched his hand out. And I'm not, I'm not. This isn't supposed. It's not negative. But what really, really, really helps when those organizations is when Bob Husky, the vice president of produce for Costco is standing at a, at a thing at our industry convention saying, this is really important to me. Then a lot of organizations and growers start to say, well, then it's important to me too. So Peter has tra really tried to stick that hand up. And there's people in those organizations that have stuck their hand back to Peter. But what really changes it all is when Bob Husky standing in front of Peter. Then all those organizations start going. Yeah, uh, we're interested in being in the room now. Yeah, to state the obvious, um, that those associations are much more interested in what the retailers have to say than anything I could say. But I'll also just say that the nature of a trade association is that in its membership embraces the whole gamut, the whole spectrum uh, from, of what Ernie would call the naughty employer all the way to the best employer. And, and so the trade association typically isn't the best partner for us because their part of their job is to protect the interests of their less good members uh, and not just uh, their best members. So we have relationships, uh, we, you know, on the basis of, of the understanding that Ernie just referred to, um, but they're not really our change agents. They're not our multipliers. Okay. Then, Ralph, you mentioned well, you had a Well, I, I, I was gonna say something else, but I, I wanna thank you all for your presentation. I wanna, I wanna second something Peter said. I, I remember many years ago uh, talking to a, uh, a lobbyist for one of the agricultural trade associations said, why are you defending this, that, and the other bad practices. <laughs> and he said, we always run with the slowest horse on the track, which I thought was a good metaphor <laughs> for their for the problem you just outlined. So I just want to second that. Um, I, I, I do want to say that, it, putting on my consumer hat, I do the grocery shopping in my family. And um, I have not, I don't see it in most supermarkets any visible, uh, there's, just, there's organic and non-organic, and that's, all I think I see visibility. I know you guys are trying to market this, but I don't think it's penetrated lots of the markets. So uh, just uh... oh, no, it hasn't. And to the point, I mean, the Costco, which has been to Costco's eternal credit for over a decade, has been paying millions of dollars a year extra uh, to get the label on their product. They have basically said we don't. We think that the label should only go on on product from retailers who are paying that premium. So you'll find it in Costco. You'll find it in Whole Foods. There are a few smaller retailers, but some of the other places you may be shopping, you won't because those they have not chosen to pay that premium. Yeah. But that's it. That's one of the challenges in consumer marketing, as you say. Yeah. And my last question is just uh, um, under the Agricultural Labor Relations Act itself, 1975, coming up on 50 years. That it for purposes of labor relations, it disregards the farm labor contractor's legal role as employer and makes the grower the employer for agricultural 
labor purposes. I guess my question is just farm labor contracts are still the cornerstone in, in our in California in the system. Do they have what's do you have any comments on their role and what you're doing at EFI? So. Wow. Well, do you, do you have another hour? <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, maybe maybe to, to to respond to one of the earlier questions about contentious issues, right? Joint employer responsibility was a huge issue in the negotiation of the standards, right? Um, EFI did develop eventually a certification program for farm labor contractors after much debate. We have exactly one certified farm labor contractor who could meet those standards. Um, uh, FLCs are a reality. I, I, I think it's not likely that we're going to make a lot of progress in the FLC world through the um, through the certification mechanism. I'd love to be wrong about that. Um, I think one of the one of the uh, strategies that we're pursuing through the ethical charter implementation program in in the coming year is at least beginning to get FLCs to report on their labor practices to employers who contract them. Um, I, this is not going to change the world in the next year or two, um, but it's the beginning of generating transparency and visibility into the FLC's labor practices that over time, I hope we can strengthen through that mechanism. But uh, it's a huge, I mean, I, we could have a whole separate meeting on FLC's. I'm sure Eric, uh, who has a lot of experience from the union perspective, would have a lot to say. And and Ernie, who who increasingly right um, has had you know is an employer who's had to look at that option as well. So it, it doesn't lend itself to a quick answer. But can, can I just add one thing, uh, Peter? Is I was very impressed with my brothers and sisters in the labor movement being, after much discussion, being open to talking about it in EFI. It was a lot of political capital in there with themselves and their organizations to say, okay, let's talk about it. So it was, again, those are those trust building times that that really moved me to see them say, because I got it, it's a big thing for them. And it was super cool for them to say, you know, okay, let's let's take some risk here. It was kudos to them. Well, thank you all so much. Um, Christy, do you have any kind of closing thoughts or anything? Um, well, I just want to thank everybody here for this really amazing conversation. I've learned a lot. Um, and I think this has been, you know, we're talking about the role of government and the state and vis-a-vis -vis the role of sort of these other kind of non-governmental initiatives. And I think these are the kind of conversations that move us closer to thinking about how we can work together. I think you know, the state, as much as they have an enforcement role, also has an education role, which we have out as well. And I think, um, anyway, for me, this was a really exciting conversation. And just thank you so much for inviting me. And um, I don't know if anybody from EFI wants to say any last thoughts. We really appreciate the invitation. Let's keep talking. Let's figure out how government gets a seat at the multi-stakeholder table. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. informative. Thank you. And thank you, Kayla, for coordinating everything. Okay. Um, we will now open it up for public comment on any part of the meeting. And I understand we do have someone in the queue. Um, so Santiago, will you call on? I believe it's Matthew. Matthew Allen. Yes, uh, good uh, almost afternoon, uh, Chair and board members. I'm Matthew Allen with uh, Western Growers Association. Um, I'm I'm really rarely surprised anymore, but today I'm I'm a, just a tad bit astounded. I'm afraid to say on uh, the action that was taken on item number three um, regarding the sublease uh, from Cause, and I just would be remiss if I didn't um, make uh, a brief comment to that. Um, I recognize that uh, legal controls are being put into place regarding co potential conflicts of interest, and th those are absolutely necessary. But at the end of the day, that uh, uh, doesn't uh, negate the very public perception uh, that uh, there's a, and continued concern of a lack of impartiality on behalf of the board on matters that may uh, become uh, uh, and forward toward all of you uh, on a matter uh, that that could become pending. So I just find this very troubling. Um, and the fact that it, uh, you know, wasn't uh, agendized earlier on the agenda is also uh, an issue of concern. So um, 
I raised that and uh, something we're really concerned about. Thank you, Matthew, for your comments. And I get, I, you know, maybe we can have some conversation, you, Julie, and I further on to kind of talk through some of those concerns and see how we can best address that. I think it's definitely something we, not these concerns specifically, but yeah, you're specific I, to you. And I really do appreciate that. Uh, I would just ask that and sort of, and, and looking through that, you know, one, one could just imagine uh, what the perception would be if um, there was a sublease at, say, a Western Growers Office or uh, some other industry office or a grower office. So it just, it lends itself to, to this concern. So um, I appreciate the ability to comment today. Thank you, Matthew. Any other comments in the queue? Not at this time. Okay. Okay, and with that, the board will now recess into closed session. Thank you. Great, right, everyone is admitted and we are recording again. Okay, thank you, everyone. The board has returned from closed session at 1248. Our next agenda item is announcements. Our next scheduled board meeting is November 13th at um, 10 a.m. And with that, we will now conclude the meeting. Thank you. Bye.